My name is Kevin Alcuni, and I'm a librarian with the Exploration and Creativity Department of the Los Angeles Public Library. And I'm joined by my colleague, oh, wrong way, I can't do it. Jennifer Duarte, the children's librarian from the Benjamin Franklin branch. It is our pleasure to welcome you to today's uh, uh, Your Author Series, featuring illustrator Man One. Please feel free to use the chat box to send in any of your questions or comments, and they'll be answered towards the end of the program. Also, don't forget to email ecdept at lepl.org for your chance to be entered to an opportunity drawing to win a copy of today's book, Chef Roy Choi and the Street Food Remix. We would also like to take this opportunity to recognize and acknowledge the first people of this land, honor their elders, past and present, as well as their descendants who are citizens of these nations. For more information on which territory you may reside on, check out native-land.ca. And of course, we want to thank our generous donors, the Lenore S. and Bernard A. Greenberg Fund, as well as the Library Foundation and our amazing behind and our amazing behind the scenes staff for helping bring these author and illustrator programs to you virtually. In today's Your Author program, artist, curator, multi-award winner, illustrator, mentor, and entrepreneur, Man One will help kick, kick off the summer reading <clears throat> challenge by discussing his work on illustrating Chef Roy Choi and the Street Food Remix. And now, the moment we've all been waiting for, welcome, Man One. Hey, how hey, you doing? Hey. Welcome. What's up? What's up? What's up, everybody? How you doing? I'm doing great. There's a lot of AC in here, so it's great. Perfect. <laughs> nice yes. uh, yeah. All right. So uh, thanks for joining us for today. And for we're sure. going to get to know more about you and your creative process and your work with Chef Roy Choi and the Street Food Remix. All right. Yeah. Look, email and you get a copy of this book. Right. So, um, yeah. So I understand you brought some slides for us to share. So I think we're going to. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if we're going to read first or if we're going to jump right into uh, some of the slides. Yeah, I think we, we could just talk about. Uh, yeah. yeah. Can you. Uh, so I guess we'll start with the first question we had kind of um, put down for uh, for you. Can you talk about your journey to becoming an artist and uh, when did that start for you? Yeah, I mean, um, I tell people I've been an artist my whole life because um, ever since I can remember, I was drawing and painting and, um, you know, maybe it has a lot to do with the fact that, uh, you know, my parents are immigrants, so I'm, I'm first generation born, born here in, in, in the States. I was born and raised in Los Angeles and um, my first language was Spanish, you know? So I think when I was like in preschool and kindergarten, maybe I, I didn't kind of couldn't really communicate with the kids because I didn't know English. So that's why I love to draw and I share with friends and make friends by, by the drawings I did. So, so I always look back at it as like, art has been kind of like my first language, I think, because as far as back as I can remember, I was always drawing, you know? Um, move forward to, um, you know, sixth, seventh grade, um, hip hop became a thing. And I started, I started uh, wanting to break dance and, wanted to be a DJ and I sucked at both of them. So <laughs> I didn't, I, I didn't know what was going to be next, um, but I loved hip hop and all that, but it was funny. I didn't really look at the graffiti at the time, um, but I was very interested in the murals and things like that in East LA that I would, I would see all the time. It wasn't until I got to high school that graffiti all of a sudden jumped out at me, you know? And so if we want to go to the, the first slide, um, when I started doing graffiti, um, I actually started by doing it on the bus. Um, one day a kid had a marker and asked me like what I want to do. And, you know, I was, I was like, what, you know, what is this? And he's like, I'm just doing graffiti and you know, here's a marker. What do you, you know, put your name up just to put your real name. <laughs> so I was listening to a group called Mantronics and I wrote Mantronics on the bus and I was like, Oh, this is, this is fun. You know, it's, it's a way to kill time on the way into, um, you know, high school every day. So um, within a few weeks, I decided, you know what, I want to do this on the streets. And so here's a example of, of my terrible artwork back then on the streets. But um, so this must be like 
87, 88, maybe 88. Um, and so you see on the, it's hard to see because it's an old photo. We had I-10 cameras back then. We didn't have, uh, <laughs> we didn't have <laughs> iPhones or anything. Right. Um, but you'll see like my name, Mantronics, is still tagged up there to the right-hand side. But in the, the, the big letters, the colorful letters just says man. So I shrunk down Mantronics to the first three letters, man. Uh, because I figured there's no way I can do all all nine letters of Mantronics or you know whatever across the the wall because I'll probably get arrested by the time I get to the X. So <laughs> so I just stuck to Man and that became my street name. So later on I dropped the Mantronics and I just kept Man and I became Man One and um, I just was like immediately like this is what I want to do um, for the rest of my life you know and so um, um, no one was doing murals and getting paid for it back then but i instantly knew like i don't know how i'm gonna make a living but i love doing graffiti and it's so much fun and i want to do this for the rest of my life and so here we are still doing it yeah <laughs> what yeah. What, kind of, what kind of drawings did you do as a child just like regular stick figures did you use like any books to kind of learn anything well uh, interesting story my mom always um tells this story about when i was in kindergarten my very first day in kindergarten, I drew this tiger with a little boy, but his back was to the audience, you know, to the viewer. He was holding a balloon. And um, when I got to school, she dropped me off. And within a couple hours, the teacher called her and said, oh, you got to come back to school. And I got to show you something. And she thought I was in trouble or I did something wrong. She runs back to school and she says, do, do you know your son knows how to draw like this? Wow. And she's like, Oh yeah, he does that all the time. She was no, no, no. This isn't like normal. Like kids don't draw like this from the top mm. of their head um, with this kind of anatomy and whatever, with without any references. You know, like this is not what kids draw at this age. And so she was like, "Oh, okay, whatever." <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she was cool. Impressed. Good for him. And you know, to this day, I tell my mom, you know, how come I don't have any of my drawings? And I was a little kid. I just have all these stories. And she goes, "Because all your teachers wanted to keep the drawings, and I let them have it." Oh, and, and I said, and she said, if I knew you were going to be an artist, I would have kept them. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, anyways, so um, I was always just drawing from whatever. Um, I remember specifically there was a there was a few stages. Um, for example, I was into animals for a long time, especially birds. Mm -hmm. I was drawing cockatoos and macaws and parrots for a long time, like when I was maybe third grade or fourth grade, and then it developed into uh, <clears throat> cars and motorcycles. Um, hmm. Actually, because a friend of mine was drawing, was good at that in class, so me and him would sit and, and draw that. So we we're drawing from, from books and photographs, but also a lot from, you know, just top of the head. And obviously, when I got into graffiti, that's what was so exciting is that I was able to just invent whatever I wanted. There was no right or wrong. You know, obviously, there was books like spray can art and, and subway art that were kind of our Bibles that we, you know, looked at every single day to get the inspiration and how to do the letters. But... It was yeah, really yeah. like you could do whatever you want with graffiti, you know? Yeah. It's cool. Right. I love it. I love how you have these childhood memories. <laughs> um, my husband is actually yeah. Spanish speaking too. And he said that when he was in kinder, the teacher would tell him, follow the yellow line. And he was looking for an ice. He was looking for yellow, you know? <laughs> <laughs> So, so right. it, it's very interesting how like all of these experiences, right? And how, right. so speaking of that, um, can you tell us how long it took for you to finally land on the style that you use now? Um, well, you know, it's funny because style means a lot of different things to me. Uh, number one, my graffiti style, meaning my letter forms, um, that took a long time to develop so that my my lettering became unique to me and how I'd like to paint and, and, and all that. Um, back then, you know, there was no internet to order your paints or your caps or anything like that. There was no shops to go buy. No your Amazon. Stuff. Yeah, nothing. You know, <laughs> so we were making it up as we went and we were figuring out how to get lines, line quality on pieces and all in you know, certain colors. You know, there was very limited and the, the color palette was very limited. Um, so, so to me, style, that's, what I what it comes to mind first is my wild style, my my graffiti letter forms. But as I developed as an artist, and you know, after I went to college and and and, and started doing this full time, um, so one of the things that I started really gravitating towards was I 
decided to start painting portraits, um, which a lot of people know me for that now. So maybe you're talking about that. You could show the next slide. This is probably um, the first time that I painted a portrait in this specific style. And this was 1997, I believe. Let's see, it should, yeah, 97. And so this is a, a portrait of my niece, uh, Demi, and uh, she was one year old at the time. And I just thought it was a, you know, kind of a, a cute picture of her or whatever. And um, there you see the graffiti letters, which say my name in gold on the left-hand side. It says man, um, but, you know, that was cool. I was messing around with that, but really the, that stylized portraiture, um, that it, it, it kind of resonated with people. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't know how it was going to come out. You know, like I, I had painted this style with my characters before this, where I was doing a lot of very, uh, colorful, um, you know, graffiti kind of characters. Um, but then when I applied it to, um, a portrait, I was like, well, I don't know, how well received this will be. I don't know if it's going to work. <laughs> uh, mm. And thankfully it worked, you know, it, it became a, 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 it's definitely one of my signature styles. And now I do a lot of portraits, um, not only commissioned for people on, on canvas and panels and stuff like that, but also, um, you know, I do this type of portraiture uh, for murals and public art all over the city and stuff like that. Um, and obviously on the, on the cover of the Roy Choi book, you know, I did a portrait of Roy Choi in this style. So, um, so that's 1997, and I started doing. I started graffiti in 1987. So you you can say it took me at least 10 years of messing with the spray can to get to this stage. You know. Wow, that's that's beautiful. As an artist, you're evolving, and it's 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 it never stops, right? Yeah, it never stops. stops. Yeah, well, it's, it's interesting. So. Um, I guess it just took you a while to kind of figure out what you like doing and what what you what you might have been pretty good at, kind of thing. Well, it, yeah, it's that. It's always like the the you're practicing and trying to develop. But then the other yeah. part of it is how do you stand out? How how are you? How how right. can you, you know, in a city like LA with millions of people, um, hundreds of, of artists, thousands of artists, how do you stand out from the others? You know, how how do you differentiate yourself? how can you create something that becomes your trademark, you know? Right. Um, and so that's all part of the journey of being an artist, you know, is you want to have your voice and be able to express your voice. And yeah, uh, yeah it takes a while, you know? Yeah, for sure. I think we lost Jen. Let's put her back in. Hi, oh. <laughs> you're back. <laughs> I'm back, sorry. Brief, nope. brief hold, brief pause. Nope. Yeah, no yeah. worries. Uh, who were some of the artists that were inspirational for you when you were uh, kind of first starting out? Well, um, like I mentioned a little bit, you know, the first artist I saw on the streets in L.A. was when I was a little kid and in Rock and Roll Boyle Heights and East L.A. and things like that. I would see artists like the like like um, like the streetscapers, uh, the East L.A. East Los streetscapers, um, you know, David uh Botello, Paul Botello, Wayne Healy, um, you know, all these guys were really like, and I didn't know who they were. I didn't even know their names back then. It wasn't until later that I realized these people had names. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I was just impressed by the scale of what they were doing. Um, you know, just so many artists, Chicano artists from from back then that I that I used to look up to and, and just admire. Um, you know, even Ken Twitchell, seeing his murals on the sides of the freeways and and things like that. Um, but, um, you know, other artists that really influenced me growing up, um, probably like I say a little bit later, more towards like um, my developing high school years and, and definitely college years was artists like Sid Mead, um, who mm -hmm. actually I got to meet and, and, and be friends with, you know, mm -hmm. passed away a couple years ago, but um, I loved his work. Um, you know, obviously, uh, Chaz Bajorquez, who's a good friend of mine now, um, is is one of my kind of like uh, mentors, you know, like I, I loved his work so much and um, uh, followed him around when he used to go to his gallery shows all the time and and kind of just stalk him because I, <laughs> I wanted to figure out, you know, how he was doing that, how he was being able to create his own language in graffiti and put it in, in museums and in galleries because, you know, when I was coming up, this stuff was not in museums. It was not in galleries. 
Um, but I knew it could be. So I was like, let me learn from the few people that are doing it, you know? So he was definitely an inspiration. Um, and then like the whole gamut of like graffiti artists. I mean, if I'm talking about LA is definitely like Hex and Slick were, were big inspirations, uh, especially the way they did characters and, 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 and painted. Uh, it was so good. Um, and then going back to the old school New York guys, um, you know, seeing their work on trains, like artists like Lee and Futura and Dondi. So those guys were always, you know, uh, top notch and just like really inspiring. So I think as an artist, um, for me at least, I get inspired by everything. Like it's, it's really hard not to get inspired by something. Um, and when you see other artists and they're doing top level work or interesting work or different types of work, um, that's very inspiring, you know? And um, another reason I love to travel, you know, every time I travel mm -hmm. the world, uh, which I haven't done lately, obviously, because of all this going on. But um, that's one of the, the biggest kicks about traveling to other places is seeing the art and seeing how it's produced and seeing how people interact with it, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, did you ever take, like, uh, like classes, like professional classes or, like, uh, uh, you know, art classes to kind of improve your improve yourself? Was that, was that also a path that you would take? Well... You know, when I went to I, I went to Loyola Marymount University um, and I got my degree in fine art. And so, you know, it was uh, it, I, I loved going to school there. I really got a lot out of it. But at the very beginning, it was a little bit um, a little bit weird because I remember being so excited to show my professors like all my graffiti work. Like, look, this is what I do on the streets. And then I remember. I remember a few of them seeing my work and they were like, oh, that's nice. That's cool. But why don't you put that away and learn the rules first before you start trying to break them? Mm -hmm. And so I got I got very discouraged. And so during the day I was painting still lives and doing portraits with oils and all this kind of stuff. And then at night and on the weekends, I was doing graffiti. <laughs> so I was, doing the, I was doing like the Superman Clark Kent thing. And, oh, right. um, you know, it was uh, it was kind of weird. Uh, because I saw it all together. I saw it, it was all it was all art to me and they didn't see it that way. It wasn't until my junior year that I had a design teacher, uh, professor, who actually just had lunch with a few months ago, um, Carm Good, who really, um, he's the one who pointed me in the right direction. He happened to see me showing my friend some of my graffiti photo albums and he said, let me see that. And I showed it to him and he was like, why, why haven't you ever showed us? This is, this is what you should be doing in class. Sure. And I was so confused. I'm like, that's not what the other guy said, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, he was like, no, no, no. This is what you got to be doing in, in, in class. So he, he encouraged me to, to do my graffiti style in every single class that I took. He says, wow. I don't care if you're doing ceramics or if you're doing printmaking, somehow include your graffiti sensibility into it. And I did. And it was well received. I could. I was like, "Why didn't no one tell me this earlier?" So um, after that, it was great. So the last two years, I integrated all my stuff, and you know, even some of the paintings that I. I think I only have like one painting left from from that era because the rest of them sold. Um, oh. You know, I started. I had my first solo show in 1994, which was a year after I graduated, and sold a bunch of work. You know, so um, you know, it was it was it was great. It was a really really um it was a really nice affirmation <laughs> to, to yeah, get that very gratifying to put in so much yeah. work and then have it be well received because that always that doesn't always happen you know you you do the work right. and then it's like yeah and then he's just like oh did i did i make a mistake <laughs> did, I, did i turn left instead of right and uh, right. so it's nice that you were able to um kind of get that positive feedback um right yeah and, and it's uh, also nice to have that epiphany so young right instead of like right. You know, oh yeah. Lives, sure. People, artists go back and say, I yeah. wish I could have started, you know, but that's really well, wonderful. Yeah, yeah no, so that's true because um, that's one of the things I've always had, you know, I mean, I started doing graffiti. I was like, I don't know, 16 or 17 years old. And like, I, I, I remember that within months I was like, this is it. This is what I want to do for the rest of my life. <laughs> like, <laughs> and I wasn't kidding. I wasn't a joke. Like it was, really yes. like, I have no idea how, how I'm going to make money doing this because no right. one else is making money doing this. But this is what I'm gonna do. Yeah, and, that's um, all. That's very rare, right? It's very, very it is rare. very rare. And I, I have three kids, and yes. none of them 
like that. And so <laughs> I'm always like, why don't you guys know what you want to do already? What's wrong with your problem? <laughs> And then uh, my wife reminds me, no, most people, it takes time to figure out what they want to do for the rest of their life. Yeah, long time. Try to stay A to B, right? You, yeah. you were there. <laughs> yeah, I was like, let's, yeah. let's do this. Let's get on with this. <laughs> yeah, it's so, yeah. pretty fortunate yeah, to, uh, to have your passion and then kind of see it through. And then I'm like, oh, okay, cool. I get to do the thing I'm loving. Um, yeah. 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 Well, this sort of, you spoke a little bit about um, artists, but what are some other current artists that you find inspiring? Oh, man. Um, that's like uh, another infinite list that I can, I can just go on forever. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, some of my friends um, are actually very inspiring to me. I, you know, um, and these are some of the friends that I've had for decades um, <clears throat> who are now legitimate artists in their own right. Um, artists like Vile. Vile One, um, you know, my friends, uh, Marka 27, uh, who's, who's out there in New York now, and, and um, uh, Pro Black, who's over in Boston. And I mean, God, it's, it's, I can just talk about artists all day long because, you know, like I said, um, I think I was a graffiti fan first before mm. I was an artist. You know, like when the first time I saw graffiti, I was like, I don't think I could do that, <laughs> you know? So, um, so I've always been just a big fan of, of, of all kinds of artists. And I think to me, it's still graffiti artists are, are the ones that, that, that still like, you know, give me a little bit more inspiration. I mean, I love other, other types of art, of course, you know, um, but you know, that's, that's where I gravitate. It's my love is still, is still graffiti. Yeah. Do you ever, do you ever visit when you travel, do you visit art museums and things like that and just kind of take it in and just kind of look at what other people, I mean, both historical and current times yeah. is, um, you know, it, it's, it, it, it depends because like, for mm -hmm. example, I've been to New York a number of times. I've never set foot in any museum in New York. Then <laughs> oh, yeah. I've never been to like, you know, the Met or the or MoMA or anything. And then when I get home, I'm like, oh, why didn't I go there? I should have gone there. <laughs> um, <laughs> but when I'm there, it's like I have friends taking me to go paint walls and, and okay. go hang out with other artists and stuff. And to me, it's like I'd rather be doing that. You know, I'd right. rather be painting walls and hanging out with my friends and, and, and dealing with the contemporaries than yeah. going to museums and looking at a bunch of you know dead people. Like I'd rather hang out with the, the living artists. Um, You're immersed but, in the current art world, right? Yes. Yeah, 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 exactly. And and that happens, you know. But I do like to go to museums, and obviously, when I get a chance in certain cities, uh, I'll go see, I'll go see, you know, ex exhibitions, of course. Um, but uh, but it's not like when I travel, that's not the first thing I think of. You know, usually it's like, uh, can I paint a wall there? Who, who do I know? Who do I know that can hook it up? <laughs> you know, that's yes. kind of what I'm yes. what I'm thinking about. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, we'll pivot over a little bit to the book. So can you talk about, um, can you talk about your book? Absolutely. And, uh, yeah, what was it collaborating like with the authors? Yeah, so um, it, it, it wasn't a collaboration. <laughs> Start oh. there. <laughs> <laughs> um, the way it happened was um, one of the authors, June Jolie, you know, uh, June Jolie and, and Jackie Briggs Martin. <laughs> and, um, they had already written or, or were writing, you know, the, you know, the, the, you know, the book, right. They were already mm -hmm. working on that. And I think it was, um, a June Jolie that told me that she met one of, uh, our mutual friends, um, at some conference or something. And she was talking about, oh, I'm writing this book about Chef Roy Choi and blah, blah, blah. And we're looking for a, for an LA artist. And he recommended me and told her, oh, you got to talk to my friend, Man One, and blah, blah, blah. So the the, the publisher, uh, Readers to Eaters, um, you know, they they contacted me, you know, Philip, Philip Lee, Philip is the publisher and great guy. And we've got to become really friend, really good friends ever since then. But I remember him calling me one day and was like, hey, you know, we're doing this book. Um, it's almost done, but we need an, an illustrator and, um, we love what you're doing in LA. We love your style. Um, we think it'd be perfect for this book. Would you be willing to consider it? And I don't think I asked him how much money he'd pay me or anything. I was like, yeah, I'll do it. <laughs> you know? And um, there was a, a couple of reasons for that. Number one, I, I've always wanted to do 
a children's book. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Where the Wild Things Are is still probably one of my favorite books, yeah. just in general. Uh -huh. Because I remember like seeing that as a kid and just like, I, I couldn't believe that, that I, these crazy creatures were in this book, that it, whatever. And um, it's always stuck with me. And I was like, well, if I could do a children's book like that, you know. Um, so the hardest part about doing a children's book is finding a publisher. <laughs> because yeah. you can draw it, you can write it, you can put it together. You could even self-publish it. But um, it's not going to get out there. It's not going to get, it's, it takes a lot of work to get a book out there. And so when you, when you hear from a publisher who's willing to work with you and willing mm -hmm. to give you that opportunity, like, I was like, let's do it, you know? And um, obviously the, the bigger reason was that I thought, you know, the book was really good. Um, uh, Chef Roy Choi is actually a friend of mine. I mean, I, I known him for before he became famous. Um, and so it was about him and his, and his story. And I was like, this is great. You know, it's a perfect match. Um, and I'd love to illustrate it. So it was, it was kind of like, uh, it was hard. It, it would have been hard to say no to it, you know, like, right. Don't tell them that, they, but yeah. if, if they wouldn't have offered me money, I probably would have done it anyways. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but anyways, um, yeah. So that's, that's why I jumped at it, you know, for sure. Yeah. I wonder, I wonder what they had completed before any of the illustrations. Um, well, like, I'm, you know, Having having never done a children's book or any any kind of illustrating for a book before, yeah, yeah. You know, I I I've done a lot of illustration. I I actually have an illustration rep, and I do a lot of jobs hmm. for huge companies and stuff like that with my illustration work, but never for a book. And it was really different because usually my my assignments are very short, right? Like the client calls me one day, uh, we negotiate it. They send me the the brief, and then like two weeks later, I deliver it, and yeah. then like I'm on to the next job, and then I see it <laughs> published like six months later or whatever, right. um, and it's over. It's like <clears throat> like it's like a one month thing at the most. Well, this thing took forever. <laughs> I mean, oh. it. I was like, I didn't know how to approach it. I didn't know the scale of what a, what the layout was, or right. I, I knew what I wanted to do. Um, which was I wanted to incorporate my graffiti and I wanted to spray paint and have it be like legit, you know, like I didn't want to just like make it look like whack graffiti because obviously, you know, my name's on it. So it's got to look good. Um, but I was like, no idea. I had no idea how I was going to make that translate into a book. And so it took a lot of, um, trying to figure it out. And so I can show you like, um, this might be a good Maybe I can show you like some of the paintings. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So see if I can, I think I can turn this around. Um, no, nope. that's off. It's the other way. No. Nope. I think it's under the settings. And then that's yeah. the camera. It's under the settings. Oh, that's right. That's right. Okay, yeah. there you go. Got it. Got it. Yeah. All right, here we go. So um this is one of the, the the drawings from the book, or paintings from the book. Oh, cool! And it's it's a it's a pretty cool. big canvas. Um, and actually, what I'm gonna do, let's just go into the back. Wow. I'm walking through my studio now. I'm going to go into the back because I have some of the pieces here. Already kind of. This is my studio space. Ooh, look at all that. Yeah. Wow. We'll, We'll talk about that right now. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> but so this is um, this is Ooh, like the watch. I recognize it. Yes. Right, that's in the book, and this yes. is you know you, you can see it's a pretty large canvas. You know, um, originally I wanted to do all the illustrations and spray paint, mm -hmm. but then I realized there was no way because like for example, here's another one that's in the book. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. I remember that right? one. And um, this is like the the map of LA. Yes. So I painted it like this, but then in in, uh, in Photoshop, I added like the numbers of the interstate oh, yeah. and the and the city uh, names. I right? love the shout out to Boyle Heights. Thank you, everyone. I saw yeah, it. <laughs> exactly. Um, you know, this was funny. I remember when I did this, the publisher was like, "Why do you have this blue line? Like, <laughs> maybe let's let's crop it out." You know, and I said, "That's called the Alley River." <laughs> yeah. And he was like. 
He was like, I had no idea there was a river in L.A. I'm yeah, like, no yeah. one does. Yeah, most people don't. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, anyways, here's like another piece. Let's see if we've got the glare. Sorry, I didn't take the plastic off of all these, but no, we can right. see it definitely. Yeah, yeah. So that's, that's all right. Yeah. So yeah. this is yeah. like Koreatown. Yeah. Koreatown. So I went down there and took photos and stuff like that, and then I used that as inspiration for the. And these are all spray paint on canvas. Wow. And then after the spray paint, I. I photographed them and, and in Photoshop, oh. I would add all the drawings of the people and everything else. You know, <clears throat> this is obviously like the spread of, um, you know, like I think it's the first page of the book, right? So it's uh -huh. downtown, downtown LA and kind of my style, right? Yeah, so, yeah. So that's, that's, uh, that's originally how I came up with the whole idea. Yeah. How long does it take? for like one canvas piece to be completed by you or did it? Yeah. So each, each canvas, you know, took like, um, a few hours, you know, to paint. Oh, okay. It wouldn't take that long to paint. What, what right. takes long is the, the rest of the rest of the thing, you know, putting it together and digitizing it. And, I see. Yeah. Photographing uh, it and then get, yeah. And then putting it in and then like fussing with the, uh, the setting. Right. Making sure that, yeah. Yeah. And then, um, we, we can come back. I, I guess let me go back to the the other room. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> wow, that's a great glimpse on how, I mean, showing us all that we don't know, you know, that that part of children's bookmaking or any bookmaking, really. We see right. the final copy and see, wow, this looks <clears throat> great. But I love seeing that uh, those, those panoramic views, right, of the illustration. Right. So that's right. really lovely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, um, yes. so for example, um, in the book, and I'll show you some quick things. So like, you know, you saw the paintings already. <clears throat> um, you know, so for example, this painting that I just showed you guys. Yes. You know, yes. So the, so the drawings um, were done in Photoshop. Uh, uh, actually, they were, the drawings were done in pencil first. Okay. Um, hold on, I'm, I'm kind of weird right here. Can't see what I'm doing. Oh, there it is. So I would draw like Roy Choi and all the other elements in pencil, and then I colorize them um, in Photoshop, right? Yeah, and yeah. Then, and then put it all together. But the the kind of cool thing I liked about it was was there's a nice like background, like a soft background and like a hard foreground, mm. which kind of uh -huh. makes you feel kind of like animation, you know, like an animation cell. Yeah. And so. Uh -huh. um, I don't know it really worked. I was really happy with 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 being able to do it that way. You know, yeah, um, I have like these overlays, right? You have things right. layered. That's really and cool. The, the other thing was that my original concept was to spray paint everything, just photograph it, and then go to print. Yes. But then <laughs> I I didn't realize even as you're working on the book, um, some of the copies changing, some of the ideas are are moving, some of the pages are being flipped, mm -hmm. and so all of a sudden like one part of the image has to be moved to another part of the image. Um, maybe some text has to be removed or, or, or something that be, you know, enlarged or, 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 or made smaller. And I was like, there's no way I can edit with spray paint. <laughs> I can't yes. <laughs> I can and edit all this stuff out. Right. Um, so <laughs> this was the best solution. And, you know, um, it, I think it took me about six months to do all the drawings and all the illustrations for the book. And, it was really tough because every time, since I wasn't used to that world of illustrating for a book, mm -hmm. um, I didn't realize that every time I stopped um, to do another project, when I got back to the book, I I, I almost sometimes forgot where I left off. Like, mm -hmm. wait a minute, what, what was I drawing? And, and, you know, and there's certain things like, for example, you want the flow, even like, you know, in the book, I have marker tags everywhere, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, that's my own hand style. It's not a font, right? It's like a font I created just for the book. And, you know, even over time, I would change the font by accident, right? Because <laughs> it was just, it was just my, my hand style. And so I would see it next to each other and be like, oh, no, I got to, I got to remember how I did that one E or how I did the C or whatever. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very complicated process, more complicated than you would think. But, there's definitely a learning curve. And um, so my next book, <laughs> <laughs> I have it figured out a little bit more, a little bit more. Maybe it'll take me three months instead of six months. Who knows? 
I love that. Did you find like there was an actual muscle memory that you had to like remember how to like do it because it had been between projects that you were going back to it? Like the actual memory of like, oh, I'm holding the pencil this way, not this way or whatever. Yeah. And then there's also this like evolution of like, for example, the characters. There was one, there was one point where um, my publisher was like, let's look at these three characters. They look like characters from three different books. Oh. <laughs> And and I didn't re- I didn't think about that. Like I was like, oh, I'm going to do this guy like this, and I'm going to do this other guy like that. And then all of a sudden, when you see them next to each other, he was right. I was like, oh my god, there's no, you know, continuity with these characters. They're all living in different places, you know, different uh, yeah. times. So, so that's another thing, right? And so, um, as an illustrator, you have to just know how to do that, or or learn it, or whatever. And um, yeah. you know, I, I learned one thing. I learned is just to really take better notes of what I was creating while I was creating it. Because for example, um, going back months later and having to change a font or having, you know, I was like, wait a second, did I use the three inch marker or did I use like a one inch marker, Mm -hmm. right? And because that makes a difference. That makes a difference on how I would do certain fonts, you know? Yeah, yeah. Right, right. And so those little details might add on time, right? To your process. Yeah, a lot. <laughs> but yeah, speaking of characters, I loved uh, Roy Choi's mom in the book. That was like a really where she's selling, you know, the, uh, mm-hmm. the food. Oh, the kitchen. She added the trunk. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> so can you tell us about your friendship with uh, Chef Roy Choi? Yeah, so um, you could put up one of the slides there. Um, so. I used to own a gallery in um, uh, downtown LA called Crew West Gallery. Um, and Roy Choi used to have his Kobe truck uh, come down to the art walk and to different things in, the, in, the, in downtown LA at the time. And oh. so um, one time I got to meet him. A friend came in and said, hey, you know, Roy Choi's here and, you know, he's a really cool chef. You should meet him. We hit it off. He's a big fan of graffiti. I'm a big fan of tacos. <laughs> so we, we became instant friends and um you know this 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 particular photo here this is his kogi truck um in the alley at my solo show in 2000 oh. um so it was really cool because we you know at the time he used kogi on twitter right so if you wanted to know where to go get your tacos you had to, yeah, right. you had to follow him on twitter so we put his location in the alley and we locked the alley door so, uh, so when people were I, coming to look for his taco truck, they had to walk through my gallery. To get, <laughs> to get to the bag, yeah. Yeah, so we instantly had a, you know, uh, uh, we doubled the size of our crowd just by having Kogi, you know, show up at our spot. It was it was pretty fun. It's hilarious. Yeah. That's really nice. I do remember the art walk, man. When, yes, that was, yeah. that was a lot of people downtown. So that's really okay. nice. <laughs> Good time. Um, you talked a little bit about this, but um, I know you have some slides accompanying, um, talking about the, the process of the book. Maybe we want yeah. to show some of the slides, Steve. Yeah, let's Just do that. Kind of, yeah, talk through some of that. Yeah. So so this one, for example, um, the obviously the cover has to be unique and different and something, right? Um, and my first instinct was obviously let's, how do I do a portrait of Roy in my style? Um, but make it pop and and make it make sense you know yeah so there's a love for music that that roy has that i have and um there's a little bit of a rhythmic um hip-hop attitude to the whole book actually i think and so i figured like instead of having him in front of a brick wall um let's have him painted on a wall of of cassettes so in the back all the white you see in the back is actually um cassettes right like a tape oh, deck, yeah, like, yeah. so they're like mixed tapes right mm-hmm. and so i remember the first time i did it i told the publisher oh i got it you know i told philip i i know how to do this i'm gonna build a wall of actual cassettes and then i'm gonna spray paint you know roy's face over it and that'll be the cover and that's what i did initially and it did not work because yeah. what i didn't realize was you're dealing with the three-dimensional surface now with the cassettes and that created a lot of weird little shadows yeah. and it didn't translate at all. 
Like it, it looked horrible. <laughs> <laughs> so we had to scratch that idea. We liked the concept, but we had to scratch the actual physical uh, painting. And I ended up doing Roy Choi on a white canvas. And then we, we Photoshopped it out off the canvas and on top of a, of a wall of cassettes. And then you see my, my, my pencil drawings in the back of the Kogi truck. And, um, you know, there's, like I said, I wanted to include real elements of graffiti. So like the font, the Chef Roy Choi is my font. It's a graffiti font that I created for the, for this book. You'll see like the yellow with the paint splatters, um, you know, things like that. I wanted that to be in the book, you know, um, obviously my tag where it says the street food remix, you know, I want it to be like Sharpie tags and stuff like that. If we go to the next one, next slide. <clears throat> um, so for example, there you see the, um, like there's a big, uh, you know, drippy, you know, uh, spray paint splash right in the middle. And, and we decided <laughs> to put all the, all these little, um, cool definition, actually little poems, um, within those splatters, um, throughout the book. Right. Um, and then, like I said, in the background is my painting and the foreground is, is, you know, my drawings that were then illustrated and stuff like that. But I wanted that flavor. You see the, the, the kids and the people are having fun and the way the boombox shape is shaped and the way the Kogi truck is shaped. It's all, I want it to be very, very like, uh, animated, you know, cause like in graffiti and, and hip hop, like it's, it's, a, there's a lot of animation going on. So that's, right. that's what I wanted to include. Go to the next page, next slide. Yeah. So, so this one, obviously, um, one of the concepts that is through, like I said, throughout the book is, 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 Roy's love for music. And I figured, you know, this, this part is about him talking about, uh, you know, well, it's about how he made his sauces and how he mixed the sauces. And so the first thing I thought of was a DJ, you know, cause a DJ <laughs> music and then a chef mixes sauces. So how do we do that? How do we, you know, merge those two things? And this is the concept I came up with. Um, you know, you can see his tattoos on his arm, you know, there's, there's not too many, uh, children's books that have characters with tattoos and maybe there'll be more, but, um, and then uh, another little thing that I hid throughout the book is you might notice that whenever you see Chef Roy Choi, he's always wearing a blue Dodger, Dodger cap. Um, ah, yes. That's cool. Even, even when he's a little kid, there's an, there's an image when he's like a little kid, he's still wearing a <laughs> Dodger cap. So whenever you see the blue Dodger cap that, you know, that's Roy Choi. Um, and obviously that's his connection to LA and all that. And that's what I wanted to talk about there. Um, let's go to the next slide. And so this is my favorite page in the book. Um, and you saw the canvas and how big it is. Um, and it says Watts because this is where he opened up, um, you know, his, uh, local, um, restaurant. And, um, my thing about it was like, I want to, I want to see my graffiti in the children's book, but done in a way that I would normally do it on the street, right? Mm. And so having this as a spread with the graffiti Watts words on the background, um, having the little kids walking in front of it, all that, um, it just, to me, that's why it's my favorite page, because it's like a legitimate graffiti piece in a book. <laughs> and- um, Oh, validating, it's, right? You're like- <laughs> it's, very, it's validating, but also like, I wanted kids to look at it and open up a book. And, and, and when they see graffiti, they could see that it could be positive. They could see mm -hmm. that it could be a message. Um, and all of it, and also that they could relate to it, you know, because they see it every day. This, the, most of these kids, you know, in the inner cities and stuff like that, they see graffiti on a daily basis and it's part of their language. And I wanted to make it okay to be in a children's book, you know? So right. I'm proud. I'm very proud of this page actually. Yeah. Yeah. It's cool. It's, and yeah, yeah. The, the canvas itself was so, so fresh when he was showing the actual painting too. So. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I definitely love this spread. I see the family and, and speaking of families and youth, yeah. um, anyone, do you have any advice for our youth who want to become illustrators? Uh, definitely. Um, so, you know, one of the things maybe um, when you're an artist, you don't know where things are going to go. You have no idea what it's in the future, except what you try to create and what you have control over. And one of those things you have control mm -hmm. over is um is trying new things believe it or not because a lot of artists get stuck with just doing one thing 
and mm. I like to experiment. You see behind me, this is this is a painting I did, a lot of experimentation and texture and things like that. Um, so I always try to do something different um, that I've never done before. Obviously, illustrating a book was a huge step into the unknown for me. But not being afraid is mm -hmm. what I try to tell kids and young people who want to be illustrators or artists um, is to not be afraid to venture out into something that's unknown um, because you're going to learn from it. And, and who knows, you may even do, you know, something good. Like the next slide, I think I have a slide here. Which one? So having done this book, my first book ever, um, I had no idea how to illustrate a book when I started. And this is just some of the awards that we've won. Wow. You know? um, and, you know, here we are. Uh, the book came out, what, 2017? Here we are, 2022, and we're still talking about it. So <laughs> yeah. it's like um, you never know where these things are going to go, you know. Um, I was just happy that I was doing a book. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 wasn't, I wasn't trying to win awards. I wasn't trying to get any praise. I was just like, I just want to be able to show somebody, look, here's my name on a book that that's that's at Barnes and Nobles and <laughs> and has my name on it, you know? Um, yes. But, you know, when you reach for the unknown and you, and you jump and you do it and you give it your all, sometimes good things happen, you know? And, right. you know, go, go to the next slide. Um, another, uh, that one, yeah. So here I am at the recording the audio book for, Chef Roy Choi and the Street Food Remix. And um, this was interesting because, you know, our book started getting a lot of attention and winning a lot of awards. And next thing you know, I got contacted um, by Live Oak Media. And they said, hey, we're going to, we, we want to do an uh, audio book on this, uh, you know, on, on this book that you illustrated. <clears throat> we want you to be the narrator. And we <laughs> want you to be the, you know, we want you to read it. And I was like, Okay, <laughs> you know, like I, I, I didn't think that I had a particularly good voice or anything, else, but they saw something that or heard something that I, I didn't. So I said, let's do it. So here I am in the booth and I'm reading the book and being a narrator for an audiobook, which I've never done, of course, before. And then um, I don't know, like it comes out, it, the audiobook becomes a good hit. And several months later, I win an award for for narration wow. <laughs> wow congratulations so, you're the you know, poster person for like working outside of your comfort level you know and and really yeah. going for it so that's great yeah so so that's that's kind of a that's kind of my my advice it's just like you never know where these things are going to lead um but you can't be afraid of when opportunity comes you know um a lot of artists and illustrators shy away from it. They're like, oh no, you know, what if I mess up? What if I do that? You know, um, and you just gotta be fearless. You just gotta say, you know what? I don't know, they're asking me to do it, let's do it. Or this is what I wanna do and no one's gonna stop me, you know? And just, I think if you have the attitude, even when you do fail, because you fail a lot, I fail a lot, I still fail constantly. But every time you fail, you learn something and you're like, oh, okay, I'm not gonna do it that way again next time. Or, wow, I failed, but in return, I got this gift of this knowledge of something that I didn't know, didn't know how to do before, you know? So yeah. there's no such thing as as failing if you think of it that way, you know? Right. It sounds a lot of it like, too, that um, by completing projects, because I feel like a lot of times when you're starting out, people don't always finish things. And I oh, feel yeah. Like, yeah, I feel like completing things is also a big um, component to that uh, success or failure. Um, finishing things and then starting new things is um it sounds like that was one of the things that you also did like it sounds like you you finished what you started yeah. and yeah because i well I mean, the, fir the first step is just to show up <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure sure because i have so many battle. friends who are really great artists but you you give them a time and date to show up for a, yeah, they it, yeah. they won't even show up so mm -hmm. obviously yeah you have to be a professional that's that's been my key um way of operations you know, that's the way I operate was like, I've always done that. Like I'm on time, I'm punctual. I do my best. I give it my all. I right. complete the project and hopefully <clears throat> it comes out good, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Great life lessons. Yes. That works yeah. for illustrations and everything, right? It, that's works, for, good. it works for life. <laughs> um, for life, yes. I guess this will be like the last question about the book, but uh, what secret Easter eggs 
um, do readers who emailed us for a free copy of the book, what could they look forward to uh, finding in it? Okay. Well, I yeah. mentioned I mentioned the the Dodger cap. That's one of yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. But I have a slide here. I think. Um, do we have a slide? Yeah, I think it's number six, right? Yeah. No. That one. Yeah. So uh, this was funny because the the image on the right, uh, on this spread, the the publisher came to me and said, you know what, I, I, uh, this is cool, but maybe we can we can do something different and move it around. And we were going to lose this page almost. Oh. And, and I said, um, Oh, you don't, you know, what is, you don't like what I did with it? He goes, no, no, it's fine. But you know, and as we talked, I realized he didn't re he didn't know that the plates, um, yeah. spelled out LA. <laughs> oh, yes. so a lot of people don't see that. And it's so funny. Cause when I, when I do talks with, with kids at schools, yeah. um, We'll, I'll pull up this slide and I'll say, what do you guys see in here? Anyone see anything uh, hidden, um, hidden message in here? And the kids like instantly are like, LA. <laughs> and, and all the teachers and principals and everyone, they're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> we don't see anything. <laughs> so uh, again, it just shows how kids are, you yes. know, they gravitate to, you know, they're smart, they're creative, they're, they, they love to discover, you know? And so, um, yeah, so that that's that's a fun one. Um, there's a few other ones like that, but yeah, but you know, I'm not yeah, gonna all the way. Yeah, <laughs> I I mean, to be fair, I also didn't see it as an adult. Yeah. <laughs> when, <laughs> I the book, I, when he started like, oh yeah, I see it now, but uh, so I guess I would fall into that teacher unobservant. Uh, I'll definitely be using that uh, Easter egg for story time when I do do story time. Uh, yeah, I will. the kids love it. <laughs> the kids love it. That's funny. <laughs> yeah. All right. What do you want to do next? Uh, yeah, Jen, do you want to pick a question and then we'll kind of maybe... You want to wrap up with one more question, Kevin? Yeah, we'll pick one more one? question and we could do some rapid fire after. Okay, got All it. Right. So let's do one more question. I think I really want to talk about books because we are librarians as it is the library. So what mm -hmm. book do you have on your nightstand right now? <laughs> it's a huge book. <laughs> And um, I can't uh, no, wait. It, it's this book right here, and it's I just got it from. Oh wow! It's, wow! It's actually, it's actually a catalog. So, um, let's see. <clears throat> uh, so I was in an exhibition with uh, Altamed that traveled um, for two years all over museums in Mexico, and so it's called Building Bridges in Times of Wall in Time of Walls. Um, hmm. And it's all these great Chicano artists. And I mean, it's, you have to see it on your own, but, and there's all these great little um, stories and anecdotes and stuff from people like, you know, Rita Gonzalez and even Garcetti wrote something in the book. Oh, cool. And um, obviously like, I'm happy that I'm also in the book. So this is my painting that was in the, sh in the show that traveled. That's so oh, cool. Wow. Right? Yeah. So, um, Representing. So that's what I, I love it. got right Building now. Building Bridges in Time of Walls. Ah. Yeah, in the back by uh, Patrick Martinez and you see the ultimate and stuff. So um, so yeah, I just I literally just got it in the mail and I was like, oh my God, this is such a beautiful book and and uh, it's nice. So, you know, it's not maybe your typical thing, but you know, one of the things growing up, um, as a you know being an artist my whole life like every time i went to the library I, as far as i can remember the first thing i did was always walk into the art section mm -hmm. and i always grabbed the biggest books that i <laughs> that i could see that you guys had in, the, in any <clears> library <throat> because there's no way i could ever afford any of these books right. you know and right. so i remember seeing like salvador dali books uh picasso you know whatever there was these huge coffee table books and i would just <laughs> sit, sit in the library and just look at all these images you know and so um, as a visual person, you know, um, I loved it, you know, so I still do that. <laughs> yeah, such a treasure trove, right? The artist, uh, the art section of any yeah. library. Exactly. They have probably the most expensive books, one of some of the most expensive books in any collection, right? Right. So right. I love hearing that. And that book, Building Bridges in Times of Walls, that, that, that's just amazing. Thank you for cool. sharing, Manuel. Yeah. For sure. Thank for you. sure. 
And yeah, like just to let people know that, yeah, when you visit a library, it's just like access to the world, art, cooking, street art, you know, it's all, yeah. it's all there for people to just kind of drink in. And uh, it's super cool. It's super cool that um, he used the library in that way. Some yeah. of the most popular books are books uh, that, you know, mural guides across the city of Los mm -hmm. Angeles. So it's just yeah. really wonderful to see that. Yep, for sure. Uh, all right, let's shoot over to some rapid questions. Uh, we got a, just, a, just a couple. So uh, I'll start off. Um, pens or spray paint? Oh. <laughs> spray paint. <laughs> One hundred percent. One hundred percent. Yeah. All right. Let's see this one. Blank canvas or blank wall? I'm gonna guess. <laughs> yeah, you, you're probably gonna guess blank walls. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, definitely blank walls. They, they shouldn't. I don't think they should exist. There's no competition. <laughs> yeah, blank walls should not exist. <laughs> um, music or quiet when you're working. Or, or the third, loud music. Oh, <laughs> Probably, sorry, oh. blasting music. <laughs> yeah, bless. Yeah, so one of the beautiful things in my studio is like all my neighbors at 5 p.m. they're gone, so, and I'm oh. a night owl. Right, so right, right. So when I'm working, the music is blaring in here. I love it. <laughs> what's What's on your rotation right now? Oh, uh, it's always for sure. I'm just, all kinds of stuff, but uh -huh. for sure, old school hip hop is okay. always going to be on there. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, I'm an old school guy. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Okay, so you already answered though. You're a, you're a night owl. Right? Oh yeah, for night sure. owl or early bird. You're a night owl. No, no, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a definitely night owl into the early morning. I was wondering if there's a correlation between being a night owl and being born at night. You know, I don't know. That's interesting. I was I was born at 10 p.m. Okay, yeah. maybe maybe there's there's so research. There's, there you go, right? <laughs> Yeah, right I'm not really sure, but sure, we'll, we'll, we'll go with it. Yeah. <laughs> we'll go with it, yes. <laughs> Did you yeah. always find your work played at night? I mean, was that kind of like your inclination? Um, well, you know, number one, doing graffiti, you had to do it in the middle of the night. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's where it started, probably, you know? Um, yeah. And, and then when you're in college and you're yes. pulling all-nighters. And uh, I remember my professor said, uh, however you study at school it, and you know, if you pull all-nighters in real life, you're going to pull all-nighters. <laughs> so <laughs> yes. he was right. You know, I, I do all-nighters all the time. Yeah. Yay, yeah. Man. And shout out to LMU. I have a family member in uh, oh, right all night too. Yes. Yes. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. This was yeah. wonderful. Wonderful. Oh, can, I, can, I, can I say one more thing, though? Yes, of oh, course. Yeah, yeah. I know. Um, and I don't know if we, I think we had a slide on it, too. But um, so it's one of the pieces of good news that's coming out is that uh, the Chef Roy Choi is coming out in Spanish. We're doing a Spanish version. And oh, so, cool. um, El Chef Roy Choi y su remix de La Comida Callejera. So ah, that's cool. I and, love it. Uh, and I'm also going to be doing the narration for the audiobook. So that'll be cool too. So that look for that in the next, uh, in the next several months. You're bringing it all home back to your Spanish roots, right, Manuel? You got right. it. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, this was a wonderful chat. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank You're you welcome. all for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed this conversation with illustrator, artist, Manuel. Remember to visit lapl.org slash events to see more of our amazing programs. And our next Your Author is set for June 17th at 4 p.m. when the Los Angeles Public Library is proud to present author Helen Koo Ree. The author will discuss Rosa's song. As always, those attending this virtual program will have an opportunity to win a free book. <clears throat> uh, also, don't forget that our summer reading challenge has uh, just started and uh, visit lapl.org slash summer for more information. Uh, lastly, until next time, we truly appreciate all your support. The success of all of our library programs cannot happen without viewers like you. So thank you. And have a great day. <laughs>